Uh, But our special guest today is an expert on Christians understanding Islam. We'll take some time for his perspectives on trends, perhaps dominating the headlines in the Middle East right now, and some thoughts on developments with a terror attack on an Australian church overnight. Well, our guest is the author of some best-selling books like Mosques and Miracles, The Challenge of Islam and Islam Rising. We'll also be talking about his latest book, and there's a connection here too to all of these big issues that we might be facing around the world. We'll be talking about Christians and prayer. You might have heard that saying, prayer is the key which unlocks the vaults of heaven. Well, get ready. We'll have some exhilarating stories today of victories won when people pray. Our special guest is Dr. Stuart Robinson. He's an expert on Islam, having served a 60-year career in mission and church planting and church leadership in places like South Asia and here in Australia. His newest book is described as a tour de force across history, the globe, the Bible and his personal experiences. Dr. Stuart Robinson's latest book is called Prayer Power, Changing the World and You. One reviewer says this book holds the keys necessary to prepare us for revival. Just a little about our special guest, Dr. Stuart Robinson is the founding pastor of Australia's largest Baptist church. Lots of listeners will be familiar with Crossway Baptist Church. He was leading it for 25 years. He was a pioneering missionary and church planter in South Asia, and he's been an in-demand conference speaker as an authority on church growth, cross-cultural mission and Islam. Stuart Robinson, a special welcome along to 2020. Thanks, Neil. Glad to be with you today. Stuart, I perhaps would be neglecting uh, the important things if we didn't start on the terror attack overnight at a church in Western Sydney. Uh, Not sure how across you are the details. Those things are still breaking. But uh, did you have a thought? There was a stabbing attack at Christ the Good Shepherd Church and a Syrian Orthodox Church. Uh, Did you have an immediate response? Um, no, not really, because I'm not surprised uh, at, at that sort of event. Um, you see, uh, the common characteristic or description which uh, Muslims claim of Islam is that it is a religion of peace. Uh, in their saying that, they are accurate, but they don't explain what they mean by peace. Uh, you need to dig into the texts of Islam to understand these things a little bit more. And uh, there you find quite a lot of violence and so forth. Um, By peace, if I can start with that, uh, Muslims divide the world into two. Uh, There is the Darul Islam, that is the house of Islam, and there is Darul Hab, that is the house of war. And where these two come together, uh, that is the place of jihad and conflict. And peace will be obtained, according to Muslim teaching, when uh, the prophet Jesus, uh, not the New Testament prophet, but the Islamic prophet Jesus, who's quite different, uh, when he returns as judge or when Islam conquers the world in total. So until that time, there must be jihad. And uh, we see that sort of violence occurring around the world. In fact... Uh, there is a site to which uh, people can go. It's called uh, The Religion of Peace. And they have kept a record of all of the um, attacks by Islamists since 9-11 back in 2001. And just before this program started, I went and had a look. And the number of those attacks now add up to 45,097. So it is against that background that I'm not surprised that from time to time we have them here in Australia. We are very fortunate uh, because in our nation, uh, Islam is only about 1% or so of the population. Therefore, in that situation, uh, Muslims tend to be uh, quiet and observant, uh, observing the laws of the nation. But if I go to other countries, particularly where the Assyrians come from in their own country, 
in the Middle East, in Iraq and so forth. They've almost been completely obliterated there under the pressure of Islam over the centuries. So now we have an attack again in Australia. But as I say, I'm not surprised at that. Now, what we've got here is uh, the alleged attacker is just a 15-year-old boy. And we might um, perhaps read between the lines and say the thing that would have radicalised him uh, to make an attack on a priest in a church uh, could be along the lines of what you're saying. There's this thing jihad. Sometimes we think that as something that's ancient or it happens in other countries. We don't think of that happening here. What are your thoughts on the fact that there would be those who would be so emotional about defending their prophet, uh, the prophet Muhammad, uh, out of jihad. Thoughts? Well, it's interesting. Um, firstly, the young man about whom I know for what we say here, said, I'm not surprised that someone so young uh, making an attack like that because uh, when you again uh, inquire into the educational literature, which is in Muslim jurisdictions, and I don't know what that situation is here in Australia, but but uh, if you look at, say, Hamas or Iraq or these sort of countries, the the children are educated and trained in this way from a very early age. They grow up with that and they don't have any other alternate interpretation. So it comes into their lives very, very early. Um, there's a very well-known psychiatrist, a Muslim psychiatrist in Sydney, very highly respected gentleman. His name is Tanvir Ahmed. And uh, back in 2014, he said, Islam is primarily a religion of conquest the fact that the vast majority of Muslims are peace-loving and committed to Australia is not because of Islam, but despite it. They have too much to lose to interpret Islam literally. So what did he mean by that? Well, of course, there are sundry Islamist movements on the rise around the world who do interpret it literally. But here in Australia, the Muslims who've come from various countries They've come to a good place and they don't want to risk that at this time in their lives. Another fellow by the name of Abdul Rahman Al Rashid, he's the um, general manager of Al Arabiya, that's a, a printing uh, organization, uh, Muslim press. And he said, It is a certain fact that not all Muslims are terrorists, but it is equally certain and exceptionally painful that m almost all terrorists are Muslims. Now, that's their words, not mine. But so these are Muslims within Islam who are recognizing the pain that this causes to the whole of their society. But because the words of violence are both taught and they're there in the sacred texts of Islam, it's up to anyone to take them up and implement them at any time they like with claiming that authority. Uh, let me ask you about a dimension no one else is talking about. Um, the church that came under attack last night uh, is an Assyrian Orthodox church. Uh, test your uh, history here because the Assyrian Christians is one of the oldest expressions of Christianity. Really, you might even say out of, uh, out of Pentecost, <laughs> the people who moved into those uh, areas, you know, in, in mission, uh, they moved into the Assyrian territories, which these days are Iraq, uh, Iran, uh, those uh, northern aspects of those countries. It is an Assyrian Orthodox Church that's under attack. Uh, any thoughts here about Assyrian Orthodox and the fact that it might not look like the ordinary Baptist Church or Pentecostal Church that people go to, but this is actually one of those great ancient expressions of Christianity? Yes, you are testing my knowledge of history <laughs> without searching it. I know that uh, the Assyrians, uh, who speak Aramaic, actually, which is, of course, the language Jesus spoke. He didn't speak English. <laughs> he certainly didn't speak Koine Greek or Hebrew. He spoke Aramaic. 
And uh, so the Assyrian uh, Orthodox people, they are the last of the Aramaic-speaking people in the world. And of course, as I said before, over the centuries, as is in the case in every Middle Eastern country where Christianity has been under extensive pressure to convert everyone to Islam, those um, Assyrians have spread around the world and some of them have come here. Um, we need to honor them because over the years of incredible pressure upon them, they have sustained the faith. We might not uh, agree with some of the ceremonies that they have accumulated over many centuries because we haven't been in, in uh, operating that long ourselves, but we need to honor them that they have uh, remained faithful under extreme pressure. Uh, they're an amazing people. Now, there's some detail about the attack overnight, uh, which some will find disturbing, and I'll be interested in your thoughts here. So I'm, I'm throwing you into the deep end because the streets around the church overnight descended into mayhem uh, when obviously hundreds who were watching the live stream of the priest who was attacked and allegedly stabbed uh, they'd turned out and uh, the police had to turn out in force too. Something like 150 officers turned out because the emotions were so high that the people who were attached to the church were not going to be taking this lightly. Uh, they wanted revenge on the spot. Christians and our response when these things happen. What are your perspectives here? Mm. You know, th this is um, an, an area in which we need to carefully think our response before we come into a crisis situation or before we uh, confront threat or danger ourselves. Because unless we do that, what will happen is in the face of crisis, the fight or flight mode kicks in instinctively. Uh, most people, of course, uh, at the confrontation of or the approach of threat, run away. Uh, even though we Christians say we, we trust the Lord, we've handed over our lives to him, uh, he is our protector, etc. But those, uh, those sayings that we have, which are justified by Scripture, we tend to forget about them when real danger approaches. And so what has happened here probably is without thinking of what the Bible says, these people have gone into a fight or attack mode. Of course, I can't commend that. That's not the example of our Lord, but nor will I stand in judgment on them. I, I understand the, the extreme grief and anger that they are living with. And of course, they've come out of a situation of abuse over the centuries. They have these historic memories of which we have none. Okay, and I guess uh, it would be important for us to recognise the response of Bishop Ma Mari Emmanuel, uh, who was on the receiving end of this knife attack, prayed for his attacker before being taken away. Uh, we'll open our talkback lines. Uh, you might have a question, a comment or a perspective around this conversation we're having today. You'll be welcome to call us. We are also going to be talking about Dr. Stuart Robinson's latest book. And if you were starting with a place uh, where you were thinking, how am I going to prepare myself if this were to happen in my backyard, you might want to get a hold of Stuart Robinson's latest book. It's called Prayer Power, Changing the World and You. I want to ask you about a new book that you've already got on the boil now and uh, you've spent years uh, just collating 20 years of study around Islam and the developments around the world. Uh, tell me about your, your new project beyond the book that we should be talking about. Okay. Well, actually, for the last 24 years, I've been collecting uh, materials and research. I do that all the time, of course. And uh, I've spent four years writing it up. I've just finished the draft. It's about 200,000 words. It's a big book. And this one, uh, which will come out sometime in the next year, will be called Future History, The Rise and Demise of Islam or Christianity. 
that's a provocative title. You see, one of the things that got me thinking about this is as you examine the church in the West, in every country, we are in serious decline, walking toward oblivion as sleepwalkers, actually. At the same time, Islam is on the rise. It's in a revivalist mode. In the 1900, uh, at the turn of that century, Islam was 11% of the world. By the turn of the century in which we are now, it's 22%. And already it's up now to about uh, 25, 27%. It is estimated by demographers that at the current rate of increase and the demise of Christianity, which has gone from 33 or 34 to 32% of the world over that century, that by the by the 2070s, numerically, Islam will be the number one religion of the world. That has serious implications. And what are we going to do about it? Uh, so the first thing is to acknowledge what's happening, to give people understanding. The second is to explain how it's happening. And the third is to craft a response. So that's what this book is about or will be about. Certainly an encouragement to get serious about your own Christian faith and understand now and do all of those things that we've been encouraged in the Bible, uh, you know, to talk to our children and to our grandchildren and pass on to them the wisdom of the faith that we have in Christ. Stuart Robinson, just wonderful getting your insights today. And I want to thank you so much uh, from every listener uh, because uh, sharing these things, uh, just timely and powerful. Thank you so much for joining us on 2020. Great to be with you. 